so the idea is to talk about the challenges in the region, the opportunities in the region, how things are happening, what, what are, uh, how are consumers uh, behaving, uh, where do you think uh, if we remove certain barriers, how does that exponentially uh, move the business uh, upward? Because this is quite a fragmented market. It's a massive market. But once you defragment it, once you are in many countries, then you suddenly have that exponential growth. I experienced it in RMX, and I see it uh, in each and every one of you. You've, you've conquered uh, most of the challenges, but that yet there are challenges. But let me start with you, Ronnie, since you are the story of the day. I'm not going to get you to talk about uh, Amazon, uh, nor the deal. Uh, congratulations. Uh, so, and maybe talk a little bit about the future. So, now that you have Amazon in town, now that you are probably going to become called Amazon, uh, having that Amazon depth with you, what would you do that you were not able to do before? How will, how will this change Sue to become Amazon? And how will you tackle the challenges of the region that you know so well about? So, I mean, I've always felt we could do a lot more. And as a company, we've chewed on a lot. But it was always we were constrained with resources. And it was mostly tech and engineering that drives most of the innovation in the company. Uh, we always wanted a great recommendation engine. We wanted uh, Arabic books, for example, and content. We were not able to do that. There's so many uh, tools that we were lacking, a, a machine to generate uh, some kind of loyalty within the, the platform. Uh, so I believe, uh, and this is kind of on the back of Jeff's visit to most of the region. I can't yet speak on behalf of Amazon. We're still Souk okay. and we're not Amazon. So, but I think Jordan was impressive. They find it uh, quite exciting from a talent, hungry talent is what they call most of the Which Jordanian. is where you have a lot of your engineers. Yeah. How many and engineers do you have in Jordan? We're about 300. So I'm excited to see if we can get that to triple and quadruple. We've kind of dried out from the top talent, but I think there's a lot coming from the universities. And we as a company need to vet our leaders to be able to hire a lot more younger engineers into Jordan. So I think that will give us a lot more weapons and tooling for us to do the things we wanted to do if we can't get them from Amazon, the ones that we want to really localize for the region. Uh, so I think that's exciting that we want to grow our engineering talent and this will foster more leaders that can actually build a, a massive ecosystem down the road. I think this is the core of our success. It's all about technology and engineering because that's the innovation we're trying to create. That's, the, that's what's going to give us the flywheel. And, and the opportunity is where? In, yeah, in of course. Continue, yeah. Where? In, is it Saudi Arabia continuing to be? When, where is, I mean, where for is us the growth? What uh, do you need to do to ac actually experience that, so that for exponential us, growth? So today, if you compare uh, like our catalog to what they have, I mean, the gaps are massive. Uh, so I think just in the markets we're in, just uh, improving what we offer, uh, scaling it to, to the extent that uh, it meets the consumer demand, uh, so a lot of people went to Amazon, but actually can't shop on Amazon, right? They come to Sue, they shop on Sue, but we didn't have the catalog that they have. So trying to figure out the best of both worlds, what we can forward deploy into the region that Saudis were already maybe looking at, but not buying in Saudi, getting most of the reviews and the tools that help buyers in their buying decision, will I think exponentially grow e-commerce in the region. Fantastic. So, uh, and for us, uh, you've been focused, uh, you're, you're uh, EBITDA positive, or just about, I think. I think I can say that. And cash flow positive. So for people who say e-commerce, you can't, you can't be EBITDA positive. You can be. Uh, your margins are quite impressive. Uh, you're focused completely on Saudi Arabia recently in terms of, in terms of your growth. So maybe, maybe you can tell us what is, how can you, wh why is it that you are uh, uh, cash flow positive, EBITDA positive? You didn't raise uh, as much money as Souq did, but you're in a different category of business anyway, and what, that's what Souq wanted to be in. Uh, so uh, tell us uh, about that differentiation, uh, and what do you see happening in, the, uh, in your segment? So uh, for those of you that don't know, Namshi is mostly in the fashion uh, e-commerce business and has... has uh, has been able to sustain itself for the past few years without any uh, uh, real huge raises of capital. So 
I mean, as you probably know, we've been around for five years. Uh, we never went out and raised a mega round. We, uh, Namshi Lifetime raised around $40 million. And uh, that's what we used to sort of get to uh, uh, EBITDA break even, cash flow positive. Last year, we sort of, uh, we closed the full year as sort of, I mean, for us, that was a huge milestone because, uh, like I said, I mean, um, we, we are following in Sook's footsteps, very different model, as you said. We focused on a, it's a vertical play, so we're, we're doing fashion. Uh, we did not go into any, any other categories because um, that's the capital we had, and we thought it was a massive opportunity. We wanted to be the Zalando of the Middle East, and that's very much uh, what we went after. I think very early, about a year in, we decided that, um, I mean, and, and I think for some of the smaller companies, it's, uh, it, it's relevant as well. We didn't have the resources to go do everything ourselves, so we very um, consciously decided to partner with, with what was out there. So uh, an extensive partnership strategy with companies like Aramex. Uh, at the time, it was, uh, as, as Ronnie will say, like COD deliveries were challenging. And uh, we put a lot of engineering effort behind sort of making our partner programs work, making sure that you know, we could focus on, we could be focused only on sort of the assortment and our uh, customer acquisition strategy. And our ops was uh, largely making our partners work. And uh, that allowed us to like stay lean. So Namshi even now is 100 people. Uh, we did about $150 million of revenue last year, $200 million GMV, but only 100 people. Our engineering team is 15 people. So um, I mean, uh, staying lean is sort of very core to who we are. And, and, and uh, I, think, um, I think it just starts with the founders being uh, conscious of the resources you have. Um, I mean, we're, we're at a VC event, but I mean, funding dries up sometimes, and you, you have to watch your back, so. You have to, indeed, and, and you've, your model is, is different than Souk's, is that you're not, Souk had to build its logistics, you, you, kept, uh, you, kept your, you kept yourself as lean as possible, outsourcing a lot of the stuff, I mean, what is, where is explain to us where, where the challenge is in that, and how does it work for you? I mean, I think Ronnie will comment uh, on, on their stuff, but I mean, our, our uh, supply chain is a lot simpler than Souks in many ways. Like, it's a marketplace, so it's a two-sided sort of uh, uh, logistics stack for us. Uh, everything we sell is in a warehouse, and uh, we partnered with Aramex um, uh, from the very early days, and uh, we continue to work with them. Um, we, we do a lot of our warehousing ourselves, but uh, our forward deliveries are managed by third parties. Uh, and our payment stack is mostly third party. We don't do anything ourselves. So, uh, you know, honestly, it go goes, goes back to understanding what resources you have, having some focus uh, on, on where you want to be. And we wanted to be profitable. We had a limited amount of cash available. And uh, maybe we made compromises on customer experience, but our NPS score is sort of benchmark. Right. So, thank you. Uh, so, Mudassir. Uh, your your exponential growth is ex extremely impressive. I, the question I I would have for uh, uh, for Kareem and for you is, you've you've just raised a substantial round. You're you're probably doing a little bit more uh, going forward. Uh, you have deep pockets, uh, and then everyone talks about the profitability of of the space and visibility to profitability. So how do you? How do you balance between the necessity of, of exponential growth while waiting uh, on, on how you view that profitability? How, wh where, is, where is that balance? Is there, is there a balance? Is that something that you think about? Uh, uh, and how do you actually work it out internally so that you can get yourself to a place where you effectively can go public, and let's say? Thanks, uh, Fadi. So, um I think we uh, never imagined we would raise the kind of money that we have raised. And when we started out in 2012, the first business plan that we produced saw us raising eight million for the life cycle of Kareem, and we thought that would be enough. So the business was built on the assumption that it's gonna be difficult to raise a lot of money in the Middle East. So um, the principles and our whole DNA was very lean, very frugal. And, um, and as the growth started happening, somehow money started flowing in. But um, we have made sure that we view the business as cities as the business units. So uh, UAE, for example, for us has been profitable for some time. So that market is break even positive. So, so you see where it can be profitable because you have one example already. 
exactly. And in Saudi as well, until recently after we got some money, we, we had become profitable in some of the Saudi cities as well. So for us, every city is a PNL, and we need to just make these cities profitable one by one. And more money is not good necessarily. You know, I was at a startup in the Silicon Valley in 1999-2000. We raised $200 million in the first round, and then we spent that all in two years. So as soon as we raised the last round, we actually consciously went on an efficiency drive. We went in the company, instead of saying, let's go down and double down on growth, we have money in the bank. For the first two months, we said, let's make the engine more efficient. So in these first two months, we completely got the memory of the money raised outside of the entire, like out of everyone's mind. So people don't remember that we have that kind of money in the bank. We're still trying to run as lean as we, as we were before the funding round. And for us, the money that was raised was, uh, was a little bit of an insurance policy and a, and a war chest. We know that our competitor has deep pockets. We should ideally not spend this money. It's a, it's a nuclear weapon for us more than anything else. So you want to be continuously extremely capital efficient in, in how you grow yourself, just in case. But uh, as in my experience, uh, the, the, longer, the, the more growth you have, the longer your staying power, uh, the more, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the more the people that come from outside of the region will see this market and move somewhere else. Is that, is that something that, well, I know you're hoping that that will happen, but uh, 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 do you feel that? I mean, is that, is Uber saying, I'm going to focus on, 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 I don't know, on India and leave this market uh, for these guys because they're not going to, they're yeah. not going to move. Because everybody has the Middle East as the bottom of their pyramid. So it's the US, uh, then Europe, then South America, then China, then India, and then, oh, okay, then we have the Arab world, which is good for you. Which is great for us. And that's really what's helped us uh, get to this far, get to this point, right? But I think the, we feel that this story is bringing down on Uber in a few stages. In the first days, they were laughing at us. They didn't even think we would survive Series A, to be honest, because they came into the market before we had even raised Series A. But we sort of slipped through. Uh, then they said, after this money goes away, they will be out. So up until then, they were up until, let's say, I think the last round, they were basically trying to run us dry. And we saw them doing crazy things. We paid $2 per install, uh, $2 to acquire and install on digital. Around the time we were fundraising, they were paying $7 to acquire that same install. Didn't make any sense to us whatsoever. And we stopped buying and bidding for those installs. We started doing other things to get growth. But they were basically just trying to make the fundraising more difficult by making growth more challenging and basically make us spend the money that we had. But I think what we have seen uh, more recently, the last three to four months, is I think they don't think they can run as dry anymore. So the spending has become a little bit more rational. So I think they're in the phase where they've accepted that we are a fixed reality of the Middle East. You're here we to be stay. there to stay, and they will not be able to run as dry. Now I think we need to put some fighting punches and make them realize that they cannot win the market. Absolutely. Uh, so and then uh, and I'm going to ask this question for for everyone. Maybe I mean uh, we're all interested in, in consumer trends. Uh, Ronnie, what, who are these consumers that are buying from you? Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, how do they behave? Uh, I had a slide earlier about your uh, White Friday um, in terms of uh, uh, online payment, uh, in terms of logistics needs, in terms of mobile, uh, in terms of Arabic. I mean, uh, you have a fantastic statistic on when you ch move to Arabic, the, the, the chances of buying change. So maybe you can tell us. Uh, about what you see as, as practitioners, as CEOs, and, and consumer behavior in the region? So a expectation definitely is very high, and now you're benchmark globally. So I think this, like customers not expecting a product to arrive within two days, the content not being accurate, the customer service not being immaculate, have changed a lot. So the consumers that are around are demanding. They're definitely on their mobiles. 76% of our traffic is mobile based and transaction. So we're a mobile company while we maintain, I don't know how many people on our platform. Uh, what we have seen with mobile and we've worked hard on it is to build the habit forming categories in Sioux. We, we started in electronics, which is great on value and discounts, but not really habit forming. You don't buy enough of these products. A TV you buy once every two years. So we've moved away aggressively over the last, I would say 18 months 
to a year. Today, uh, in units, electronics has become very, very small at Sioux, and the variety is what's going, and we've seen the frequency of customers buying uh, going up to four to six times per year from our initial one to two times. So we're building quite a repeat from the same customer base because we've already had a, quite a bit of a customer base. Female uh, versus male has changed a lot. On a general merchandiser, we're now at 50-50, which when we started were very, very different because of the categories that we've added. So they're young, they're, a lot of them are female, they're definitely on their mobile, they have very high expectation, they interact with local content well, uh, they love brands, uh, we still see a huge affinity to the bigger brands. We've tried a lot to disrupt the brands with newer brands in the region. We still see a, quite a concentration of brands. And I think what I see has changed is the level of interaction, the sophistication of the customer. And we have to come across as much more transparent. You can't anymore tell a, a customer a seller didn't ship or it's the courier that didn't deliver. We have to know exactly where the product is. We know where their mobile is, we know where they're at, and just figuring out how to make the experience tenfold better. And how does Arabic language affect? I mean, tell us, tell us about So if you look at beyond the UAE, most of the site is consumed in Arabic. Our Saudi site is about 75% to 80% maybe in Arabic. There is an expat community, clearly uh, from the Asian countries, that consumes the English site. And we just see when we... And this has been a challenge for us because a lot of the content is not available in Arabic. So we have to produce sometimes within Saudi Arabia, which is not a country you can scale big teams quickly at the scale that we need. Uh, we see Arabic reviews playing a major role. So products with reviews in Arabic sell a lot better. Uh, we are now even taking the feedbacks and the reviews from the Arabic users in Saudi Arabia, giving it back to the brands to make some product enhancements. And it's a major conversion changer. It's about uh, 1.5 more if you are within the local market. Um, it's challenging on technology products because you don't have the right lingo to describe some of the products. And there isn't enough review sites or comparison sites in Arabic that are rich in content. Most of the comparison sites are available right. are only on price. But this is not the game. The game is all about content. And you create that content inside. So uh, that, that those reviews are, are your reviews or do I source that? No, we, we get them from the buyers. We incentivize the buyers to give us the reviews. But we also have a moderation team to sure. make sure that the reviews sure. are not all about specifically the product itself. And it's critical to have reviews. I think for us, we see it as very critical because there are a wide tail of products and people don't know them, they heard about them, they want to read them, they want to read about them and the sure. reviews help. Uh, just having that content all in Arabic is, is a definitely Arabic. plus. Having it on mobile makes it sure. quite easy and impulsive. Sure. sure. Faraz? Yeah, I'll uh, echo some of what Ronaldo said. So even for us, like mobile is huge, Arabic is huge. Uh, interestingly, we also saw this shift from, we're a fashion site, so our early customers, the skew was more towards men buying sports shoes and sports gear, Nike, Adidas being big brands, but over the last couple of years is, uh, I guess, um, as e-commerce has matured, as sort of more people have started going online, more women have started going online, um, we've actually skewed more towards women and, and, and they are predominantly sort of... Uh, uh, shopping for for clothes and 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 not shoes. So I mean that that's an insight. But um, Arabic is, is is consistent, especially in Saudi Arabia. What we see is um, interestingly, um, repeat purchase behavior has been improving. So customers, as they get used to sort of shopping online, are showing us that they can be profitable. And you can spend money acquiring these customers. Uh, they are if you provide a good experience to them, they will come back. So to startups here, I feel like you know it's worth investing in. It's a customer that comes back. It's not as price sensitive as South Asia or Southeast Asia, uh, at least the, the comps that we've seen. Um, private labels are doing better. So private label contribution for us has grown uh, to a significant number now. Um, so while they're brand led, there's opportunity to build your own brand as well. And uh, I think uh, that's been the big shift as well. Like, young women going online in Saudi Arabia. And lastly, I think uh, the big thing that we've seen is shift from the big metro cities into like smaller centers. Uh, we're shipping into 38 second city tier cities. Second tier, tier two, tier three cities in Saudi Arabia across the region. Is where the growth is. I mean, there is more growth there. And I think uh, 
some of it is access, so uh, um, I can only talk about our uh, sort of our fashion catalog, and I, I think access might be a problem in some of the smaller centers. So um, I think it's a huge opportunity for digital companies to 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 tap that because you tend to be very um, Middle East is seven city city focus, and I think you can go beyond that. And, and we've actually started doing that uh, a bunch. I think that's uh, that's an insight that that, that Thank you. we've just really sort of started using. Thank you, and and with this, sir. I'll, I'll change the question a little bit. So, uh, how essential was your when you launched early on your uh, your differentiation? So you launched uh, completely focused on what the region requires, uh, which Uber took a while to catch on to. So you did your cash uh, button, and uh, and you did your uh, pre-booking. They were they were huge. What I call uh, you know, copy paste and innovate. You innovated very quickly, and they uh, you caught the market in that. How? Uh, so tell us about that importance, and how do you? How are you able to continuously innovate, and in, in, in the face of a massive company that has deep pockets and and is doing all sorts of uh, of new technologies popping up? So I think the reason we are so excited about the region is there are a lot of problems to solve, and I think. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. So we haven't really built a lot of the basic services or we're not even fulfilling basic needs of people such as transport. So when we started out, we were consultants who were traveling the region. We were not able to get a reliable means to go from the airport to the office or to the hotel. And it was such a big struggle for us that we basically started by just building a corporate service that was targeting these consulting companies and was offering a pre-booked option and direct corporate billing. It was a problem that we had experienced ourselves and that's where what we launched. And the thinking always was that let's keep learning from the feedback that people are giving us and keep evolving. So our thing was never that this company in San Francisco is doing this thing, we should copy them. It was always like what problems are we seeing that we can solve. And you know, of course over time we got inspired by some of the things they were doing but the focus was always on local problems. So when we saw people not being able to use credit cards on, on the app, we realized that people don't even have credit cards. <laughs> so that's why they're not able to use them, so let's launch cash. When we realized that people are struggling with finding locations, we decided to build our own locations database. When we heard from captains or drivers that they would like to get help from someone to serve the customers, we started a call center for them. So these were all local things that we were just learning from the people that were using the platform and we were adapting to it. And the way that we continue to do it now at some scale is if you look at the way that we are organized, every market, like the, there are four big countries that we focus on, Pakistan, Egypt, Saudi, and, uh, and the UAE, there are pretty strong teams in each of these markets. So the people that are running Pakistan or the people that are running Saudi, they are very empowered because we believe that the learning and the in innovation will happen on the fringes, at least as far as we are concerned. So we give them a lot of power to give these insights back to the product team and we make sure that these big countries get prioritized. So today, you know, you had mentioned this, this phrase in one of our leadership meetings. We also run like a federation where an innovation happens in the fringes and sometimes Saudi does something that we now start replicating across all markets. Two weeks ago, Saudi launched this delivery service which your name got attached to as well and it became so successful that now we're telling Pakistan and Egypt you should do the same because this is actually taking off. So a lot of innovation has happened on the fringes that we have learned from and then we have institutionalized and rolled it in other markets. Um, Ronnie, I know you're sticking around for a few years in, in Amazon. And uh, uh, it, 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 so Amazon talks about artificial intelligence. It talks about how uh, and machine learning. It talks about predictive analytics. Where? What does that do to somebody like you in the business? I mean, how, do you, how will you be able to mine the data that you have and, and uh, find ways to actually alter what you do or, or build on, 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 these, uh, on these trends that you are seeing in the clients because of the big data that you have? I mean, you have how many clients do you have? Eight, eight million recurring users? 10 million. 10 million. Customers. So I mean, uh, we've, with our own, moderate efforts, we've built our own, some of the data warehousing, and they've been 
quite instrumental in changing our conversion rates over the last uh, year, year and a half. So imagine with a bit more smart, with a bigger artificial tools, even the data warehousing recommendation, AI, uh, what we can do with our data that we have and how we can use it. But also we can mine a lot of the data of what customers in this region were looking at abroad at Amazon and figure out how we can marry the two so we can accelerate uh, that growth. On the other hand, also, if you look at our merchants, mainly, for example, in Egypt and some in Saudi, to maybe lesser extent here, but also Dubai is a trading center, they want access to more markets. And with our local play, we were not able to give them access to Europe. It was very hard for us to because we don't have a big customer base there. So even if we open up shipping to Europe, it would not have worked. So I feel there will be a both-way trade where from Egypt, a lot of made in Egypt products will actually, we will facilitate getting that abroad to the US, to Europe, which will, I think, help the ecosystem overall because suddenly the pie of a customer that an Egyptian merchant had would grow quite substantially. So I think also access to the markets is as important as the tool. But I think for our engineers to get tested and exposed to these technologies and the way these foundations work is quite essential because what I have found out, and so you can run a big engineering team quite young if you have quite few leaders that are quite strong because they can give you the discipline the rest the engineers can start innovating without the framework and the discipline how to think agile and, and go through the development cycles. I think you'll have a fr fragmented effort in output. So now uh, I see that our leaders will get exposed to these technologies and methodologies. And then we have a big farm of engineers and suddenly we'll be able to create, I think, a second wave which will allow you to hire a lot more junior people into the team. And I think that part of the, the, the the deal or what we'll bring to the region should not be underestimated. Yeah, and this question goes for you, Faraz. Also, how the the, the the you know this this region well, globally? The, the I was reading recently how many retail companies have shut down in the U.S. How concerned should people be in the business in the region in retail? What what is going to happen in the coming five years? I mean, is this is Amazon really a retail killer? Uh, what's the story? I Are you the, disrupting I mean, the business model the region, of, of this city? The region has a mall culture. It, while we have grown quite a bit, I don't think the footfall in the mall change. But there are categories where Stu started becoming 9, 10, 11%, and we started to have a say. Great. I think we're out of time. Gentlemen, uh, Mudassir, Faraz, Ronnie, thank you so much for, for this exciting panel.